Our first speaker has served in various command and staff positions to include Commander, 4th Brigade Combat Team, 1st Armored Division, Deputy Commanding General, 1st Armored Division, 49th Chief of Armor, and Commanding General of the 2nd Rock U.S. Combined Division. He currently serves as the Deputy Commanding General, Futures and Concepts, United States Army Futures Command. It is a pleasure to introduce Lieutenant General Scott McKean. All right, good morning, sound check. Let me see, uh, Dave Hodney, good? Okay, thanks. Hey, good morning, everybody, and uh, glad to be here, great to be here. I want to thank uh, Pat Donahoe and, and Sergeant Major for setting this thing up and, you know, fighting through this because we have to have these venues. Um, you know, before I get to talk about modernization, it's about us as a profession and us taking the time to talk about war fighting in a serious manner having the discussion and debate, and for all the young captains and lieutenants out there in TV land, uh, this is what we have to do. Please learn from the example of we're not gonna let COVID stop us from doing what we have to do and all these restrictions, okay? Because things like what Laura briefed yesterday, we've gotta hear those, we've gotta talk about them, and we've gotta be able to have those uh, true debates about our way forward. Because for the captains and lieutenants out there and the young NCOs who are listening, uh, all the crazy stuff we're talking about up here, you're going you're gonna to inherit. It's all going to be yours. Uh, so we've got to get this right, and we need your voices in bringing in, you know, your thoughts into what this future character of warfare, as we try to describe it, what are our best approaches at, at getting after it. So uh, just a, a word of thanks again to Fort Benning, which is always about war fighting, and, uh, and I appreciate that. So uh, I'm going to start a video here in a second, but I want to kick off day two after the great uh, descriptions yesterday of what the character of warfare might look like, and it's important that we kind of underline might, uh, because we're not sure, right, you know, and you'll get the old historians out there, you know, if there's one thing that's guaranteed is that we'll probably get it wrong, right, you know, but I like to say we want to be closer to right. And uh, that's, that's really where, our, you know, where we're stepping off right now as we look at how we approach this character of warfare that were described yesterday. And I'll talk a little bit more about it today. But so how do we get about modernizing an army? Uh, for everyone, you know, it's important that you keep up with this. And, and the challenge that we see at Futures Command is that it's hard for all of us to get past our hand in front of our face the crisis of the day rules our time and it rules our, you know, our intellectual energy trying to solve those. And so, you know, part of Army Futures Command, uh, one of its roles is to break from the crisis of the day and really think out in the future. And so it's important that you know where we are as an army, right? So there's two efforts. And I know we've kind of gone around, and this is a hard part, right? I mean, this is, it's been hard since, you know, George Washington trying to get everybody aligned and everything here, right? Army 2030. Army 2030 is multi-domain operations, right? That's our army. That's what we're organizing for. That's what we're trying to equip is the Army of 2030. And as General Funk described yesterday, the MDO doctrine that we uh, are hoping to release here in June is going to describe that. And everyone's going to say, yeah, but I don't understand it, and all those kinds of things. Look, here's how an army works, right? We publish doctrine. The army goes out and trains on that doctrine, and we find out, you know what? There were some shortfalls. There were some things that we need to adjust. Hey, this actually worked really well. And then we publish an updated version of that doctrine. You know, airland battle, which we all covet and everything, you know, it wasn't the 1982 version. You know, as General Swan probably can, uh, I'm not trying to age you here, sir, but you know, as, as General Swan practiced, you know, in, during his career, it wasn't the 82 airland battle version that really promulgated across the force. There was a lot of skepticism about it. It was more accepted because active deterrence wasn't really uh, a very good thing in the sense of a lot of people's minds, but the 1986 version, after four years of learning on airland battle and working through that piece, is where we evolved to the, you know, to the coveted 1986 version of airland battle. 
which has lasted pretty much, you know, even though we've tried some different things, the basis of air land battle has really stuck with our army since then. So it's important to kind of understand that and understand that, hey, our doctrine that you know, we're going to come out with this summer is not going to be perfect, nor should we expect it to be. But we got to get it into your hands. And the division commanders here, I'm proud that you guys are out here uh, making a trip out here because it's important. Because our division commanders are the ones who are going to put that in play at their warfighters, their national training center, or other CTC rotations. And they're going to give us the feedback of, hey, this isn't just quite right. And that's how we're going to grow. So what I'm explaining to you, though, is if we're going to get better and if we're going to make this stuff work for us, we have to be able to experiment, right? And, and experimentation is our pathway to modernization. And so let me show you one way that we're getting after, and it's called Project Convergence. Can you guys roll the tape, please? Tomorrow is worth protecting, and it starts with what we do now. Our potential adversaries around the world grow in strength and power, seeking to undermine our nation at every turn. Last year, we launched our campaign of learning, Project Convergence, with this one essential idea, that tomorrow is worth protecting. Our mission is to gain the ability to converge effects across all warfighting domains, air, land, sea, cyber, and space. This convergence of cross-cutting technologies yields the information advantage necessary for decision dominance and joint force overmatch. Project Convergence 20 focused on our ability to integrate artificial intelligence, robotics, and autonomy to connect sensors with shooters, improve battlefield situational awareness, and accelerate the decision-making timeline. This year, Project Convergence 21 progresses to a series of joint, multi-domain engagements, all of which will inform the joint warfighting concept in DOD's joint all-domain command and control efforts. Using the Navy desert ship configuration in place at White Sands Missile Range, New Mexico, the Navy coordinates with Army air and ground assets, while the Air Force links the joint force with this advanced battle management system, a network of networks. Marine F-35B jet fighters deliver faster, more effective fires, automatically processing targeting data to minimize human involvement. And special operations teams provide human intelligence and ground reconnaissance, feeding the battle network data it can't get from technical means. The 82nd Airborne Division lead an air assault force, equipped with the integrated visual augmentation system, feeding information to soldiers and mission updates based on real-time intelligence collected and received at a tactical command post at its main headquarters at Fort Bragg. The Army's multi-domain task force coordinate long-range fires and satellite ground stations to cyber electronic warfare operators and HIMARS missile launchers. In addition, like last year, prototype systems take part. Weapons like the extended range cannon artillery howitzer and the precision strike missile. Robots including leader follower self-driving supply trucks and a host of unmanned systems, ground and air, for both reconnaissance and supply. Through aided threat recognition from mobile cooperatives and autonomous sensors, we are pushing existing limits of artificial intelligence and machine learning through an AI-enabled system of network, state-of-the-art autonomous air and ground vehicles that leverage sensors and edge computing to enhance leaders' visualization of the operational environment. We've demonstrated that future vertical lift systems offer transformational reach and can be decisive, but we still must look even further to the future. This year brings in the joint force, and next year aims to bring in the allies. We continue to advance forward, identify areas of improvement, and adapt, because tomorrow is worth protecting. We have accomplished much. Speed, range, and convergence gives us decision dominance, and decision dominance gives us the overmatch we need. But we still have more work to do, because whoever can see, understand, and act first will win. Okay, Project Convergence. 
um, that, that was the highlights of what we did uh, back in October and November out in Yuma, Arizona, and out White Sands Missile Range. And it really gave us a great opportunity to see ourselves. And, and you see the title up here, you know, it's a campaign of learning. So, you know, if we're going to do this right, we've got to be, we can't be afraid to fail. We've got to get out here and try things and see what's going to work or what's keeping us from getting things to work. And look, we've got to stop BSing ourselves. Okay, we have a lot of challenges when we start talking about joint war fighting. And, and, you know, my challenge to especially those young captains, lieutenants, NCOs, warrant officers out there is stop thinking Army only. Every time we build something Army only and we try to bring it into the fold, we find out it doesn't work or we're going to have to bring a fleet of contractors in here to help us figure it out. And we can't afford that. Okay, we have to be thinking joint and combined from the get-go. Anything we're designing, if it's not going to take joint and combined into that, then I, can, I could probably write you the AAR from the, you know, before we even get done. That, to me, is the challenge that we've got to take on in the modernization community as we do these things. And so it's great having uh, you know, Matt Cansdale here from, uh, from the UK. He's going to be a big player in Project Convergence 22 that we'll be doing this October and November uh, across the western United States, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we'll also have our Australian partners as, uh, as part of that exercise as well, that experiment as well. And so combined joint war fighting. Now here's the hard part for the institution of the Army. We've got to flip what we've done for the last two decades on its head. And none of us want to do it because we're comfortable. Our experience set says we start at the, you know, the pointy end of the spear here at that, you know, soldier who is going to go out on that mission to get that HVT and do all these type of things. Okay, precision was kind of the watchword under the last two decades. Well, what I'm here to tell you is that mass is going to be the watchword that we're going to have to go through. You saw the video that General Donahoe played before, uh, after his intro remarks. There was one kind of common theme there. There was a lot of stuff coming, you know, out of those tubes. Not one, lots. So what's our ability to fight in an environment where mass is predominant? What's our readiness to deal with those capabilities that those peer adversaries have been developing while we've been out doing things in Afghanistan, Iraq, and other places? Okay, we've organized necessarily so for the environments that we were in for the past two decades. We've got to change, and we've got to change fast because mass you know, is a challenge that we have to be prepared for. I mean, we're seeing it right now in Ukraine, right? You know, 130,000 or whatever the number is, you know, lots of troops surrounding there with lots of capability. So how do we get after that? Next slide. I got the next slide here. Okay, so campaign to learning. As I said before, experimentation is going to set that pathway. And the good thing that we have right now is that our senior army commanders understand the necessity of this, even with all of their readiness requirements that they have. And as you see General Flynn's, here, uh, General Flynn's quote here, every exercise will have experimentation as part of it. He recognizes that we, we've got to be modernizing even while we're doing our readiness. And so we have to look for those opportunities to bring experimentation in. And when I talk experimentation, I'm not talking a bunch of folks in lab coats with, you know, stopwatches saying how long did it take you to get from point A to point B. This is experimenting with all the different capabilities that are CFTs. And you'll hear later, you know, Don Sando, and you'll hear uh, Larry Burris, you'll hear Ross Kaufman talk about some of the capabilities that we're developing uh, for, for the force. But we've got to bring it together and does it integrate? How do we fight with it? Okay, and, and let's be clear. 
We organize to fight. We don't organize to do other stuff. We organize to fight. All those other you know, missions we get are secondary to our primary role. And as Pat Donahoe, I know, you know, emphasizes, in the end, doesn't matter what stuff we have, there's going to come a point in time when we're facing eyeball to eyeball with that enemy. We've got to be ready for that piece, okay? So experimentation. Project convergence, which you just saw a little video, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we're moving forward on project convergence. Um, that is kind of the Army's cornerstone, campstone event for our campaign of learning. So what other, other than material things, and I'll leave that to, to Ross and Larry and the other guys to talk about material type capabilities, but what else do we do in experimentation? Well, part of the Army 2030 that I described, the things that are going to be in the MDO doctrine, we started with the soldier for the last two decades. I would offer that we have to now start from the top and work our way back down. Okay, so the division is the unit of action. Brigade commanders don't like hearing that because there's things that might kind of start coming out of the brigade formation to put up at the division level. But it's key. Again, we're going mass. We have to be able to mass capabilities, mass effects. And so how do we fight as an army? Well, let me start here. COCOMs fight. COCOMs employ service components, capabilities as part of their overall, you know, O plan, COM plan, whatever they're, they're designing. So the COCOM is going to employ our Army forces as we do this. That's important to note. A lot of us don't have experience understanding how a COCOM organizes and fights and employs its forces. For the last two decades, we've been, you know, again, for, for good reason, you know, the Army Marine Corps, the land component has kind of been in charge. And we've been dictating, hey, here's how things are going to go. We've organized it. We've done all those type of things. Well, in a COCOM environment, if you take the Indo-Pacific, Admiral Aquilino's in charge, right? And he will employ user pack, you know, all the different uh, pack fleet and all the other forces according to the COCOM's plan. Now, I'm not trying to get into, you know, 101 on joint fighting, but it's important that we know that that's where we got to be, that's where we have to start our thinking about how we fight as part of the Army 2030. So what is our inputs then into that COCOM to get the things that we need to fight on the ground? Well, we've created these theater level organizations. Okay, so you can see them up here. Theater Fires Command, Theater Strike Effects Group, and those type of things. These are the organizations that we believe will provide the inputs at the theater army level into the COCOM to help shape the battlefield and the conditions for the employment of our corps and divisions. Okay, so now we're talking some big scale stuff. The captains and lieutenants are saying, what the hell are you talking about? I, don't, I just want to know, you know, it has to start here. We will never set the right conditions for the companies, the battalions, the brigades to do what they need to do if we don't have the right structure to set those conditions. So now, do we have these right? I'd tell you right now, be honest, I don't know. Probably not. We have to do experimentation for this. We started last summer, deliberately, we started last summer. And there was an exercise called Joint Warfighting Assess Assessment, Pacific Century 21. So General Flynn, it was about 13 days in command, you know, started this, uh, this assessment, but you had the entire Indo-PACOM team playing in this joint warfighting assessment. And we learned a lot of lessons. We learned that we had some redundancy inside these organizations in the roles of cyber, intel, space, right? That, you know, it's good. Everyone's trying to get and figure out how to employ these capabilities because they're not familiar at that level in the employment for close combat operations. And so we're learning, and that's okay. And General Flynn and his team, they, they dug you know, deep into this, and they provided us some great insights. But for experimentation, you know, that's an N of one. 
So are we going to you know, take conclusions out of that? Or are we going to say, we have some initial insights. Now, how do we continue to develop that? That might be true in the Pacific, but does that apply in Europe or somewhere else? So, so it's important that we do these things. The core and division levels. Okay, our, our cores, you know, have been kind of finding their identity here over the past, you know, 10 years or so. The Third Armored Corps has been, for the last three to five years or so, been, you know, doing OIR and still trying to manage oversight back at, you know, Fort Hood. That, that, that's, that's taken a core, you know, out of, the, out of the fight, in a sense, for, for a period of time where there's kind of split base. That's never good for any organization, right? But th that kind of challenged some things. We stood up Fifth Corps. So they're standing up. So they've got, you know, they're trying to get their identity and, and figure those things out. Right now they're like accelerating that learning, right? Um, 18th Airborne Corps always employed, you know, always having their mission sets. But have we actually trained to fight a core with multiple divisions employed in large-scale combat operations? Well, we've started. We've got war fighters that start getting after these things. So, so, so it's not like we're at zero. But we've got to start, you know, intentionally looking for what lessons we're trying to, you know, pull out of those things and then start getting into that doctrine so we can figure out if we have these organizations right. The Penetration Division and Joint Forcible Entry Division. Okay, so we've got two of each right now, or at least we've designated two of each. What's their medal? What role do they play? How does the core enable those divisions? Well, we've got some initial table topics, but, but again, I would just offer it to you, it's very nascent. So, so why am I telling you all this? Is because this is where you come in. And, and I'm talking to division commanders, and, and you know, we've, we've spoken already, but for everyone's understanding out there, it's core and division commanders that have to help shape this. If I learned one thing when I was chief of armor here at Fort Benning, we did some great experimentation here at Fort Benning, and then we went out and talked to some of the operational force, and they were like, what are you talking about? Never heard of it. So, you know, a year's worth of work, and it was like, didn't fall on anywhere in operational force, and it dies. So the goal here is the operational force and the institutional force here have to be able to come together and push this forward. So every exercise needs to have experimentation in it because that's just another repetition that grows that n from one to much bigger and gives us a better sample size to think about these things we're going to do a division cavalry squadron pilot as part of the penetration division piece and you know major general john richardson he signed up for that thing and he's going to lead that effort okay so we have a a division commander leading that effort for our army. That's how we're going to have progress. Okay, it's not going to be some type of idealistic type thing that we do on PowerPoint. He's going to do it in the field, at the National Training Center, and, and give our best resources to figure that out. Okay? What are the capabilities we're talking about? So we saw John Antall gave a great presentation yesterday, right? Should have scared the hell out of you. You know, here's kind of the stuff that's going on out there. So we know counter UAS and, and in a broader scheme, protection is going to be a key aspect of anything that we do in the future. Again, back to the video, lots of missiles coming. You know, where are those missiles going? Radars command posts, what did he say? He said like uh, air defense artillery, radars, field artillery units, command and control nodes, right? Those nice tented uh, command posts that we all have, right? You know, because we've got to have everybody inside the tent, got to have a place to have your coffee pot, all that kind of good stuff, right? So these are the type of capabilities that we believe will continue or will be critical in how we fight in the future, right? So the, the network, we, we know that's a mess, okay? And, and our ability to, you know, I mean, there, there's no sugarcoating this thing, right? No lipstick on the pig on this bad boy. 
I mean, the network is a problem. It's a challenge. And we've got some things that are working to try to get a little bit better. But I just tell you, in, in the sense of prioritization of problems, that, that's probably the, the top one. And we're working on that pretty hard with different means of getting after it, okay? And I'll talk about data here in a little bit. Integrated air missile defense. Look, this is something we haven't had to deal with, right? I mean, you know, beginning a desert storm, okay, watch it, you know, get one or two scuds coming at you or whatever. You know, we've got Patriots kind of strategically positioned to be able to deal with that thing. And, but we really, in our lifetimes, have not, our military lifetimes, for everybody that's probably listening, we haven't been under the threat of continual missile barrage. I'm talking like medium range ballistic missiles and those type of things. We, we haven't been under that threat for a long time. More importantly, since we're talking multi-domain operations in a sense, we haven't been threatened in most domains in our careers. Space, air, maritime, cyber, you can kind of say, I don't know if I was or not, you know. Land, for sure not, right? We've dominated in those domains for our entire careers. Well, that's not the case today. And it's not going to be the case in the future. Now, we can dominate those domains, but it's going to have to be deliberate, and you're going to have to apply resources to gain that dominance, and it's only going to be for a period of time. So, you know, temporal dominance, basically, you know, of, of a domain in order to, you know, secure a position of relative advantage, whatever you want to call it, whatever your mission is, but you're going to have to be deliberate about how you do that. Air Force isn't going to be over the top of you. Troops in contact, get the Apaches in here. No, that, that's, not, that's not a guarantee. You're going to have to set conditions for that. And for the young captains, lieutenants out there, you know, this is something that you're going to have to learn. You are not the main effort. The main effort is going to be a division. That division might make a brigade a main effort, and they may get a lot of artillery and all those type of things from the other divisions. But you're going to have to set conditions to get dominance of a domain in order to use it. That includes space. I'll leave it unclassified here. But you know, we're going to have to set conditions in space. Cyber is going to have to be deliberate to make sure that we either protect or degrade from our adversaries or to our adversaries. So, so these are some important pieces. I'll underline sustainment. We don't like to talk about sustainment. Here, here's how we do experiments, you know, and I'll call them war fighters or experiments in my mind, right? Here's, here's the most common argument. I've made it myself, so we're all guilty here, okay? Well, I know that, you know, we really wouldn't have this right now, but I got to get to my training objectives. I want to see how that battalion commander is going to fight when he makes contact. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll bring the magic school bus of Patriot missiles in or, you know, the magic resupply of gas to, to... Folks, what learning objectives are you really giving our formations if sustainment, and I'd add protection, Sustainment isn't part of our learning objectives. We're not doing it. We have to force it. If you can't resupply, I'm just using Patriots just to kind of keep it general here, right? You know, if you can't resupply the Patriots, then guess what? You're unprotected. You're vulnerable. Now what are you going to do, Captain? You know, Colonel, General, what are you going to do? It doesn't mean that you're not going to be vulnerable during a fight. You've got to understand that. Those are the conditions. You're going to run out of fuel because your fuel dump, you know, your, your, uh, your, your class three point or whatever, got struck by missiles. And it no longer has the ability to provide. We don't have the assets to push class three or class five forward. Okay, what are you going to do? There's this thing called like controlled supply rate, right? CSRs, those type of things. We haven't had to do those things over the last 20 years. 
So what I'm describing to you as one of our great uh, former chiefs of armor and former maneuver extraordinaire General Starr used to say, hey, sometimes we've got to get a kick in the grill doors. Wake up. And, and, and I'm not saying that in a pejorative sense. I'm saying that in a sense we really have to make sure our eyes are wide open as we're talking about these things. And we can't hand wave it. We can't BS it. We've got to set conditions in our experimentation, our exercises, everything that we're doing to make sure we're prepared to get after these things. And I'd offer that our senior leaders are probably least prepared for this environment because this isn't the experience that we've been in for the last 20 years. For those who've been in for 20 years, we've not been involved in large scale combat operations, not in the positions that we've done. What's the role of the command sergeant major? What's the role of the first sergeant in a large scale combat operation? Have we defined that institutionally? We need to experiment with this. We need to do exercise. We need to grow and do those things. So, so these are the capabilities and the organizations that we're looking at in our campaign of learning to ensure that we can come together and make sure our doctrine, our organizations, our material are all integrated and that we're moving forward trying to solve some of these challenges that our adversaries are going to put in front of us. Next slide. Okay, so what have we seen so far? And again, very nascent. We're still looking at these things. Okay, future operational environment, new character of warfare. We you saw John Antal probably gave you the best visual descriptor of that. Um, Pat's video before that, you know, great descriptor, lots of stuff, mass, okay, but speed. General, uh, or Colonel Antal described being naked on the battlefield, right? You're going to be seen. You're going to be detected. That means you could be hit. That doesn't necessarily they can, mean that they will hit you or that they can hit you, even if they can see you. But that's part of the battlefield and, and the uh, conditions that we're, we're dealing with. So autonomous capabilities. Ross Kaufman will talk to you a little bit about some of the uh, robots and robotic uh, efforts we're working on. We're working on a lot of uh, drone type of technologies. So all the stuff that Colonel Antal showed you yesterday, you know, we're, we're doing the same stuff. Okay, it's not as easy as it looks. I will tell you that there's not a whole lot of autonomous engagement of targets out there. Just, you know, kind of like, I'll leave it at that. It, it's still developing, okay? So it's not as we're going to launch, you know, a, a, a swarm of drones out there and be able to just start killing stuff. It's not that easy. There's, there's a human who's still doing a lot of that, okay? Target recognition isn't as easy as uh, some would think. But my point is, is that we do believe autonomous capabilities, autonomous operations, will be part of the character of warfare as we move forward. And so, you know, I know here at Fort Benning, we're doing a lot of work with this. But as I, you know, I told my team, hey, first contact should be made by, you know, unmanned systems. Why would you lead with your face? Right? So as a first principle of future warfare, making first contact with unmanned systems is probably one of those first principles that we, you know, that we're looking at, right? So we're doing those things. So we talked about you're going to be seen, naked operation, you know, all the kind of, okay. That means that, and you heard it a lot yesterday, we got to fight distributed. General Funk said that, everybody said that, fight distributed. Okay, I agree. I mean, yeah, you know, if you mass, they're going to put a lot of stuff on you, and you know, all those type of things. But can we fight distributed? I would offer today, we probably couldn't not for an extended period of time, not in large-scale combat operations. Why? Sustainment, sustainment, sustainment. Look, our army has been predicated on the, you know, the formula of P for plenty, right? You know, we need those six months so we can get great folks like, you know, like General Perna did, uh, General Daly, all these folks, right? They need to set conditions and build that, those stocks up so that we can operate. Why? Because our tank sucks down a lot of gas. We're always going to need to eat. We always need water. We always need, you know, class 3P. All these type of different things that are out there 
If you're going to fight distributed, that means someone has to take those commodities to those organizations. We need mechanics. We have enough. You need medics. You have enough. If you're going to distribute, if you're going to fight distributed, actually distributed, can we sustain those forces, today's forces, right? So as we develop in this new character board, if we want to fight that way, then we've got to look at capabilities that are going to allow us to actually fight distributed. So there's a lot of things that we're doing. Mark, similarly here from, uh, similarly from CASCOM is here. Okay, I mean, we are working hard on this, but this is probably one of the longest poles in a tent of long poles. And, and sustainment is something that we kind of like, yeah, they'll figure it out. They just got to make sure they get it to us. Yeah, that, that's not going to work here. So I offer to all of us, we've really got to look at sustainment. Deception is going to be cool. And, and so, so just remember deception here. The next one, AI-aided decision-making. Now, look, everyone wants to talk about artificial intelligence, right? And, hey, there's a box of artificial intelligence over here. Let me go sprinkle it on, and we'll be able to make decisions faster and all this kind of good stuff, okay? You know, artificial intelligence, machine learning, you know, this is all kind of tied together. In the end, what these capabilities are going to enable is helping the commander with ability for them to make decisions faster. Okay, that's kind of the goal here. But I still say that the commander will be responsible for all that happens on that battlefield, whether autonomous or not. So AI-aided decision-making, and you, heard, you, know, you hear the chiefs say a lot, speed, rage, convergence, to help us to get decision dominance so we can have overmatch when we need it, right? Okay, but, but, but to do that, we have to understand what decisions do we need to make at echelon. What decisions does a brigade commander need to make? What decisions does a division commander make? And I'd offer what decisions does a corps commander need to make? We've got to have those discussions. Why? Because right now, if you go into any talk, generalizing, but if you go into any talk right now, you're going to have Kill TV up there. You're going to have a 1,000. You saw the picture that uh, Colonel Antal showed, you know, all the Dell you know, video screens up there and all that kind of good stuff. What's going in there? What's all that information that's going in there? How much of that is actually used? Right? So in other words, if we were to try to train an algorithm to help a commander make decisions, what would we tell it? What would we input into that algorithm? That's the thought that we need from all the folks out here during experimentation because those algorithms aren't magical. They don't just, you know, come up. DARPA doesn't sit there and come up with some magical algorithm that we throw out there and then all of a sudden it just kind of starts doing things. We've got to figure out what does a core commander need, what does a division commander need to make decisions, then we can start targeting some of these artificial intelligence or machine learning type of algorithms to help the commander make decisions faster. Now, we're trying to make decisions faster. What do you think our adversary is doing, right? They're doing the same thing. You see all the videos, China, Russia, they're peers. They can come up with the same things we are. And so that advantage that we're going to get, whether it's by some decision-making capability or not, is only going to be temporal. We're going to have an advantage for a period of time, and then they're going to figure something to counter it. We should expect that. So this is a game that's going to go back and forth. So we can either speed up our decision-making if we want to get an advantage, or try to slow down our adversary's decision-making. And this is going to be a key one for all of us and for all the future leaders growing up right now. Trust in data. That, to me, from a modernization perspective, is going to be one of the largest hurdles in achieving success on the battlefield, is do you trust the data that you see? And I go to that bullet above it, deception, because everyone is going to be trying to manipulate data to confuse you, to, to spoof you, to take information away from you, to misinform you. And now, how do we 
figure out ways of confirming the data to make those decisions. You know, lieutenant makes a call. I've got a motorized rifle regiment coming at me. You know, I need, uh, I need artillery. You know, young lieutenant clearing fires. Well, commander, they kind of start looking and do I trust that lieutenant? And what's the training level, experience level? Is he really seeing a, or he or she really seeing a motorized rifle regiment coming at him, you know? So, so there's, there's all the things that a commander does inherently based off experience and all those type of things. But what if that report is coming from a drone that's using some AI-aided target recognition algorithm and it's reporting that motorized rifle regiment coming in? Are you going to fire? These are the challenges that we're going to get. Our experiment, experimentation to this point has shown that we have challenges in trusting our data. Because we, in this room, haven't had a whole lot of experience with it. We've got to get it in the hands of our captains, lieutenants, NCOs, warrant officers. Let them start figuring out what they can trust, what they can't trust as they grow up with it throughout their careers. Okay, and you see kind of the other pieces. But in that cloud down there, and this is, these are my words, right? Data is a new ammunition, not the new ammunition, right? So I just want to kind of clear, you know, from my perspective, it's a new ammunition because, you know, we've had data out there, but employing that data, getting the ability to answer a core division brigade commander's you know, requirements for the decisions they have to make, it's gonna require that data. Now that data has to get to them. And right now that's, that's a challenge. That's not a guarantee that we're gonna be able to do that. So more, more, more to follow on that one as we try to work through that. So how are we doing it? And this is my last slide and I'll open it up here, but how are we doing this? Well, we've kind of set up a little roadmap here to try to at least, and there's a lot more that's going on, but some of the major touch points to help get after those organizations and the different capabilities. Project, and it kind of goes from bottom to top here. Project Converge 21, I would call it a technical employment of capabilities. We try to connect things, right? We try to connect a special forces team with a maritime asset to fire a Tomahawk missile from a special forces team sitting out in the desert watching a target, all right? And, and some of it worked, some of it didn't work, some of it worked, but with a lot of workarounds. So that was the basis of what, you know, we started our learning with. Global Defender, so here in April, and, you know, we got a lot of challenges with what's going on in Europe, but uh, Joe Costanza uh, and the 3rd Infantry Division, along with the 3rd Armor Corps, are going to lead a warfighter that will be, you know, have an experimentation component to it where the 3rd Infantry Division acts as a penetration division to help us figure this out. Uh, you know, again, we has, we've had some changes here, so we're working through some units, but 3rd Armor Corps, if possible, may represent a, or replicate a operational fires command to figure out whether that's the right thing or not, you know, or how we go forward on those things. In May, General Flynn is sponsoring a Pacific MDO war game, right? And, and that war game, we're going to experiment with those theater organizations. How do the processes work? How do they get employed? How does MDO apply in the Pacific? In June, well, this is the big tentative one, right? At least what we had scheduled was General Cavoli was going to do a multi-core command post exercise to experiment with those theater organizations in Europe and some of the capabilities that we're looking at employing in, in, in different capacities. So, so two theater, our two theater armies, you know, with four-star commanders in them, are both in the experimentation business trying to help us solve these things. Unified Quest this summer when we bring all the senior leaders together with the chief of staff of the army and the secretary, we're going to discuss our observations, our insights from these experiments. This is where core commanders, division commanders, COE commanding generals are going to have their inputs into where we are, what we need to do. Does the MDTF, should that be underneath the theater fires commander? Should it be independent, 
you know, organization. I don't know. Let's experiment. Let's look at that. What were the insights? What were the results? That's how we're going to try to get after that piece. And then there's a globally integrated war game. I started off talking about COCOMs. Well, all the work that we've done, now our representatives will go into the joint staff globally integrated war game and represent the Army with those capabilities as part of the joint warfighting concept. Okay, so that's how it all kind of comes together. Our campaign of learning leads towards input into the joint staff's wargaming so that the Secretary of Defense, the chairman, get good input into how the land component will fight as part of the joint and combined team. That's our pathway. That's what we're doing. That's an update on modernization. That's not complete, but that's kind of experimentation is how that's helping us get after that. We're doing it with our partners and allies. We're doing it with the joint force, and we're trying to make sure that we're coherent and bringing the operational force to make sure those insights are somewhat validated by our operational force. So with that, we got about seven minutes, so. Yes, sir. I'll ask the first question, sir. So do you have a vision of how we're going to fight this at the small unit level? Like, is this going back to like the 1950s with the Potomac Division, where you enter the battle zone and you spread out, you don't talk to each other for a couple of days? Like, do you have a, like a mental model for small unit, how we, how we get to this, sir? So, so to be honest, I mean, we're starting up at the core and division level, right? We've got to get that right. And so the conditions that we, as we experiment, the conditions we believe that the Corps and Division can set for our brigade combat teams is what that fight will look like. Today and probably till 2030, I think it's going to look pretty similar to what it, look, it would look like today. Okay, you're going to have engagement areas, you're going to have, you know, folks establishing obstacle belts, you know, and doing all the different types of things. I think it's going to be pretty similar at the, you know, platoon, squad, company level, it's going to look pretty darn similar. What's going to be different is you're going to have a whole lot more things coming at you, and you may or may not have the tools to counter them. So now, how does your maneuver, how does your employment of your forces change in order to survive on that battlefield and win? That's, that's kind of how I'm seeing that piece, but we've got to figure out what can we do at the division core level first? How are we setting those conditions? How are we ensuring that protection, sustainment, intelligence, and all those type of things are established in order to enable the maneuver of those forces? And what's key is, remember, you know, brigades have been kind of independent actors here for the last 20 years. You know, you got brigade commanders coming up with their core. Brigades in, in this environment is an execution arm. They're executing the orders of that division. The division is employing their brigade combat teams for the purpose of the division, as opposed to a brigade employing its forces for the purpose of that brigade. And, it, and it's, a, it's a leap that a lot of us are familiar with, but we just haven't had a lot of practical experience with recently. Any questions from in the room? All right, sir, from our virtual participants, we've had several questions on logistics on the sustainment portion. Uh, the general just is, for instance, GCSS Army is not hardened and the homeland is not secure. There are initiatives to harden our, our nipper networks to, to provide another question related to sustainment doesn't have its own cross-functional team. Like, how are we getting after hardening our sustainment, sir? Well, this is like a, a, a weekly conversation I have with Mark Simile here, right? Okay, so we are working on a, sustain, a sustainment tactical um, system in order to at least get a transport, in other words, the ability to pass data, um, sustainment data, on a secure net. Doesn't have to be sipper, okay? It just needs to be secure. So we're working that right now. Here's the challenge, okay? So what's the mission command system that's receiving that? You know, the last one that I know of was BCS3. Okay, and that went away years ago. So what's our mission command system that sustainment is tracked on. People say, well, it's Geeks A. Well, Geeks A does, only, does a certain portion of sustainment, but it's not what, you know, the, the totality of what sustainment does. So, you know, that's something that Mark and his team, Steve Dondero at the C did, are working on right now, but, but we have a gap there. So if I was to tell you what's the mission command system today 
for, you know, for sustainment, it's, I'd say it's Excel, right? You know, some spreadsheet that some great logistician has figured out and, and set up for that unit. But Charlie Costanza's picture of what he has in 3rd Infantry Division is probably a little different than uh, Beegs, uh, you know, from 10th Mountain and all that stuff. So how does a core, how does the great 3rd Armor Corps bring all that together? I don't know. Are they reconciling uh, Excel spreadsheets? Are they, these are the things that we've got to fix. Mark, similarly, at CASCOM is looking at them. He's looking at a way to try to get after these things. You know, starts with connectivity. Can we even talk to each other in a secure manner and pass data? Now it's how do we manage that information, which is going to be a big challenge. Thank you, sir. Got another question from our virtual participants on balancing the risk. We talked a lot about building out uh, core and division headquarters with additional capabilities. How do we balance the risk of hollowing out infantry armor and reconnaissance battalions to build all this new force structure and capacity, sir? Well, it's a great question. Um, you know, just because we're re-looking divisions and cores doesn't mean that they need to grow, doesn't mean that they need to, they need to reorganize, they need to restructure. I don't know if that's going to equate with growth. Obviously, you know, everyone, that's their first default is, well, let's put another section there. All I'm saying is let's just take the G2. Does the G2 need to have X amount of people in it? You know, what are the functions that it plays? And what does it need? From a technology perspective, hey, what can technology help us do right now? If you take something like PED, right, you know, and you got some young private out there. I used to watch this in Korea all the time. I know Steve Gillen did too, right? You know, young private out there looking at all this imagery and all these type of things, trying to figure out what it is. When we know that there are, there are ways of doing that by algorithms to at least take care of a, a lot of the mass that comes in and get a lot less things falling on the floor. But we have to be cognizant of our combat formations that they still have the capabilities to do what they need to do. In the end, and I'll hit that point again, in the end, we're gonna be staring you know, eyeball to eyeball with somebody and someone's gotta put the bayonet in the belly of that enemy, right? You know, someone's gonna stand on that ground and, and own it. And, and so it, it, it's a great caution that as we do these things, we can never forget that those combat formations still have to have their capabilities. Thanks, sir. And our final question, uh, discussing division as the new uh, unit of action, what are your thoughts on moving to a division-centric CTC rotation rather than brigade-centric, like taking an entire division or part of it to NTC or JRTC, sir? Well, we had a great discussion on that yesterday, and I think our, our CTCs do need to transform. Uh, they got to keep up with what we're doing here. Uh, we need to in, encumber, I think is the term, encumber our divisions as part of these rotations. Uh, you know, a lot of times we say, okay, well, we're going to send attack and leave it at NTC for, you know, 90 days in order to get a bunch of brigade. I don't know. Why do we have to do that? Why can't you? I mean, I don't know why you can't do it from home station. That's called distributed operations, right? Why can't you command and control from, you know, Fort Riley into the box? Oh, well, we're on a different network. Well, why are we on a different network? I, I mean, we've got to think through this. I don't have the answer to how to do all those things, but yes, I do believe divisions need to be part of these CTCs because they should be employing and doing the condition setting for those brigades. And then the brigades are executing that order. And, and again, it's close fight. You know, they might have a, they, the brigade's deep fight might be, you know, something with artillery or whatever, but it's something that it should be shaped and, and directed from the division because it's even part of a core operation. The cores are employing two to five divisions, all those type of things, right? And those divisions are setting conditions. So is it the main effort brigade for that division or is it a supporting effort? Well, if it's a supporting effort, it may not have any artillery with it, right? No artillery. Might get one priority target for planning because that artillery has all been taken over with the, you know, the, lead, the divisions that's a priority effort with that lead brigade as priority effort. We ready to fight without artillery? We might have to, if you're a supporting effort. Your ground plan is supposed to be able to succeed without you know, those enablers. Those enablers are exactly that, they enable operations. All right, sir, thank you. Okay, thanks everybody.